I tell you, I don't know if, if I was in a dream just then. I tell you, that singing, that's so powerful. Our God, He is alive. Amen. And I thought about how just that related so well to the song before. Is God, his, our living God, sent His Son to literally walk with us, and that's Jesus who we hold our hand. And when we all get to heaven, when we all get to heaven, that's the focus. I can't think of a better way for us to, to, to begin as we're looking at the concept of hope this morning. I tell you, I, I want to mention, though, I hope it's okay, but uh, Nancy Locklear is here with us this morning. And I'm sorry to, 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 to do this, but I tell you, we have been praying, and I have mentioned that earlier. We love you so much, sister, and all that you've gone through. Just such an encouragement for us to be together. And, and that's an example that being together, that's what it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's, what it's all about. Last week we talked about dwelling in hope. And you may recall the slide that we had was this picture. You may not have seen it because all the words that were on it, you probably didn't even see it. And, it, and maybe you can't really tell what, it, what this is. But this is the picture of what I imagine Joseph saw at the bottom of that dry pit. We just read about his brother said, see, here comes this dreamer. Let's see what becomes of his dreams as they throw him into that pit. And so this is Joseph. I just picture him looking up at the sky as he's hearing them converse. We'll discuss what that conversation was later on. But I, I thought about this idea of being in the pit of despair. Joseph had a hope that we can access. And I was reminded this week that there is a world of hurt. We have the conflict with Ukraine and Russia, the situation where there are, are brothers and sisters in Christ in Russia and brothers and sisters in Christ in Ukraine that do not want this conflict, and we are seeing the pit of despair. But I was reminded, uh, it was a 26-second clip. Some of y'all may have seen it on the news, but there was, there, there, was a, there was a group of Ukrainians that gathered into the metro station and because they were trying to, to get out, away from the shelling, and there was immediate worship that went up, and they may have been singing, Our God, He is Alive. I, I don't know. It was in Ukrainian. I couldn't understand what they were saying, but it was the most beautiful thing other than what we just heard. And one day, when we all get to heaven, I'll be able to know what they're saying, and they'll be able to know what we sa said as we sang just a moment ago. That's the beautiful concept of, of hope that, that rang out through that metro station that no bomb could touch. And so as we're getting, as, as I was thinking about this lesson, it just, um, it, 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 it hit home. Joseph was in the pit of despair, but he had hope, and we will as well. And we can look to the example of those who showed it. And so, I want us to think about that as we're, we're looking at this concept of hope is the dream. See, Joseph, his brother saw it as a curse that he was the dreamer. But Joseph had a different perspective. And we're going to look at Joseph's perspective that will help us find hope in any pit that we find ourselves in or that we see in this world around us. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 Hebrews writer, he begins in a beautiful way when he says, Long ago, at various times and in various ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. Verse 1, he's spoken to us by the prophets. Well, have you ever wondered how did he speak through the prophets? Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1, beginning, we're going to hear how God speaks and it's an interesting, this is, this is really one of the most intriguing passages to me. Numbers 12, 1. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he'd married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses, right? So God speaks through Moses. Aaron and Miriam, his brothers and sisters, they recognize it. But they're saying, has he not spoken through us as well? Notice it says, has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. All right, so the Lord hears Aaron and Miriam's grumbling. They hear Aaron and Miriam 
questioning Moses and God. Verse three, now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam, come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out. You could almost see Aaron and Miriam, see, told you so. God speaks through us as well. And you can see them walking out to that tent of meeting. And the Lord came down in a pillar, verse 5, of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forward. See, Moses, he's talking to, through us as well. You can see it. Verse 6, and he said, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. And those are the most important parts of this passage for our lesson, that when God speaks through a prophet, he spoke through a vision, he spoke through a dream. But verse 7, he says, Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Their dream of God speaking through them just became a nightmare. It is not what they thought. But what this shows is very, very important for us that God spoke mouth to mouth, face to face with Moses as he saw the form of God and that through what Moses wrote, we have the law of God. We have God's direct line through Moses of his revelation to Moses. But through prophets, it was different. It was shrouded. It was with riddle and it was with dreams. So when we're talking about Joseph being a dreamer, Joseph understood that this was from God while others misunderstood. And so keeping in mind with that idea, we're going to, get, I think, draw some great conclusions for our hope that we'll find from the pits of despair. Hope was in a dream's interpretation. It wasn't just about the dream. It wasn't just about having that dream from God. It wasn't like Aaron and Miriam saying, see, God speaks through us as well. It wasn't about the dream. But look at Genesis chapter 37. If you'll turn there with me, and, uh, and, and we're going to start in verse 5, go through verse 7. Now, these are the dreams that started the whole problem with him being called a dreamer. Well, and it wasn't a problem, but you know what I mean. Verse 5, now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, hear this dream that I've dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Wow. Now let's, let's look at verse 9, the second dream. Then he dreamed another dream and, and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I've dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. So he relays these dreams. And we understand that this is what gave him the name, the nickname Dreamer. And as what was read for us, they, were, they said, here comes the Dreamer. Let's see what happens to his dreams. They take him and they put him in that dry well. And we understand that, that it was Reuben who, who actually said for him to go into that dry well because they were just going to kill him. But it was, it was Judah who got the idea, you know, what worth are we, what value is it to kill our brother? Why don't we see, see these traitors that are coming through to Egypt? Let's sell him to those traitors and let's make a profit from our brother. And so, you know, that as he's sitting in the, the, the bottom of that pit, he's hearing that conversation going on. And they sell him to those traitors. And those, I wonder what he's thinking as he's going into slavery. And then he's sold into Potiphar's house. And we understand that, that as he's sold in Potiphar's house, later on he is, he is, he, he's, he's, he's told that he, was, uh, that he was trying to seduce the Potiphar's wife and, and he's wrongfully accused and he goes into prison. Man, he's in prison. You talk about the pit of despair. You think, you know, he had the bottom of that pit. And that pit, you would think that was the bottom. No, it, get, it got lower and lower, didn't it? It got worse and worse. But then he gets two of the officials of Pharaoh that come into the prison. And we understand that it was the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. 
But both of them had interesting dreams, and Joseph was able to interpret their dreams. The interpretation was where the hope was. Well, the hope was for the cupbearer because he was restored to his position. But it was the baker that thought since he heard something positive, hey, maybe there's going to be a a positive response for me. There's hope. He was going to be killed. Well, it came to fruition, except that the cupbearer forgot Joseph. And for two years, he languished in prison. Oh, can it get any worse? Look at chapter 41 and verse 15. This brings us to, to, uh, up to speed. Verse 15, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. So how did, Joseph, how did, how did Pharaoh hear this? The cupbearer, who literally would have drank from that cup in order to save Pharaoh, was literally close to Pharaoh Hey, you know, there was, you know, what's, what's wrong, Pharaoh? What's, what's going on? I have had these dreams. You know, there was someone in prison who answered ours. It came to fruition. Look at verses 1 through 8. This is going to give us the dream from Pharaoh. And just see where the idea of interpretation, why it's important. It's not just about the dream. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke. What did I just see? You can almost see it. He wakes up. You ever had a dream and you wake up? Wow. What was that? And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. Behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears. And Pharaoh woke, and behold, it was a dream. But look at verse 8. So in the morning his spirit was troubled. Why is he troubled? Because it's not about the dream. It's about the interpretation. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. So that's why verse 15 is so important. At last I have found someone. The wisest that I consider in all of Egypt couldn't answer, but you can. Hope was found in Joseph for the interpretation of his dream. Second, hope and the, the, the interpretation was from God. The interpretation had to be from God. Uh, and, and, you know, we can easily hear a dream and start interpreting it. I, I think one of my favorite ways to illustrate this is a Christmas carol. And maybe you've read the book or, or seen some of the depictions in movies about this, but if you'll recall, you've got Ebenezer Scrooge. He's in his, he's in his room at night, And he has a dream, and Jacob Marley comes to him. And his response is, you're nothing but a bit of moldy cheese, an underdone turnip. He says he thought this dream, the answer is it's just indigestion, and he goes on. See, we could interpret this, but it's the interpretation of these dreams is not up to man, it's up to God. And Joseph recognized that all too well, because man's interpretation got him into a pit, Look at verse 8. It says, His brother said to him, Are you, of, of chapter 37 of Genesis, verse 8, His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. They, they read the interpretation that Joseph thought he was better. That is not the interpretation, but his brothers took it as that to the point they wanted to kill him. And they started this journey for Joseph and for the rest of the world. So it's interesting, verse 10 through 11, his own father gets into the interpretation business. From the second dream, verse 10, it says, But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you, you think you're better 
than the hand that feeds you? You think you're better than your father and your mother who brought you into this world? I brought you in this world. I could take you out. I heard that all my life. Do you think that's how he responded? You know, notice he just hears this dream and it is, that, that's it's his interpretation. Ah, his interpretation. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So at least Jacob saw that there's something in this dream, he kept it in mind. But it's important that when we come to the revelation of God, it is not up to your interpretation or my interpretation. Peter, through the Holy Spirit, through the same process that God spoke to the prophets, spoke to the apostles. And Peter wrote down this concept of interpretation in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, beginning, if you'll turn there with me. Verse 19, he says, And we have something more sure, the prophetic word. How do we get the prophetic word? Through dreams and riddles. We have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Check. The brother's the father, they all got it wrong. Uh, e- e- even the, the, the chief baker heard the interpretation and said, ah, I'm going to get a good report. It's not up to the person who hears the dream. It is up to God. Uh, in, in, in fact, um, that's in Genesis 4, 41 and verse 16. I realize we didn't, we didn't read that, but Genesis 41 and verse 16 When Pharaoh has said to him, I hear that, Joseph, you're able to interpret these dreams. What was Joseph's response? 41 and and verse uh, 16. Here we go. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it's not in me. He is answering the highest in the land, and he's saying, I can't interpret your dream. Do you realize how quick he could go back to the prison cell? He's got to be careful how he responds to the king. It's not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. God will give favorable. So he's saying it's God who gives the interpretation. Just like Peter who recognized that, that it's not up to someone's own interpretation concerning the revelation of God. And we've got to realize that as God has given us his word, that it's not up to us to make those interpretations. It says, verse, back in 2 Peter 1 and verse 20, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In the third place, the interpretation had to come to pass. And see, in order for this to be hope, from within a a dry well, hope from the whole, if you will, then the interpretation had to come to pass. It had to be answered. Well, so we remember the dreams that he had back when he was then given the name Dreamer. Genesis 42 and verse 6 beginning. 42 and verse 6 says, Now Joseph was governor over the land, He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Does that sound familiar? It was to Joseph. Joseph saw his brothers and he recognized them. But he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? He said, they said from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. How did Joseph recognize his brothers? A lot of years has passed. How would he recognize his brothers? Verse 9, and Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. You see how the dreams that God gave to Joseph sustained him in that pit? That that would have to come to fruition. The moment he sees his brothers bow down before him, he's seen this before, but he dreamed it. It has come to fruition. The answer to God's message has come to pass. But then he, he, he's going to carry this on because there's a second dream. This gives hope. I'm going to see the sun and the moon. 
I'm going to see my father and my mother. That's why later on he's saying, is my father well? I'm Joseph, is my father well? <laughs> he wants the second answer to his, his dreams. You see how he had hope from the revelation from God in the pit of despair. And in the pits that we experience in this life, and, and, and our brothers and sisters throughout the world, we realize that we have our own. How do we find hope? When we look up from that pit and we look up at the sky, do we see God? Our God, is a, there is beyond the azure blue. Remember that, that picture you can see in the top left corner, of that, that azure blue sky that we're looking at. We're looking to God. Paul tells the Corinthians that very thing. In, in 2 Corinthians, if you'll turn there, chapter 4 and verse 16, he says, We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. See, he could have looked to the things that were seen. He could have looked to that conversation he heard with his brothers over whether to murder their brother or to sell him. And he could have thought about that, that this is the worst thing this could have ever happen to me. And as he's, as he's shackled to the back of a cart and he's being brought, brought down to Egypt and then he's sold on a slave block, he's brought into that house. He could sit there and think, this is... This is the worst, woe is me. This is, the, this is the worst pit there could be. Then he finds himself in prison. Oh, I thought it was done. You know, it always comes in threes, but this is the fourth. What is the, what's the deal? I don't deserve this, God. This shouldn't be me. But it was the dream from God. It was the interpretation that he was able to see along the way that he had the answers to his prayers. We do not lose heart. We focus on the pit, we will lose heart. But if we focus on what's outside it, we will not. We focus on the light. That brings us to the fourth and final point. The interpretation showed hope was fulfilled. When he sees his brothers bowed down, it is the answer that he needed. But think about what has taken place. The dreams of Pharaoh. Genesis chapter 45 and verse 4 beginning. Genesis 45. So do you remember after they have to bring their brother Benjamin back with them the second time and he has put the, the he's had his, his cup put into Benjamin's, uh, you know, grain. You see he's playing with them. <laughs> and he gets another uh, opportunity to have an audience with them. In verse 3, it says, And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. How do you think they heard that? I'm your brother Joseph, who you sold into Egypt. And they're thinking, we're about to get ours. We're about to go to prison. I mean, who could blame him for, for what he's done? And now, he says, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. He, you know, he sees it on their face. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Wait a minute, I remember, you know, I'm sure Reuben is there. I'm sure Judah remembers the words he said. I'm sure he played through those in his mind for a long time. God didn't send you here, Joseph. We sent you here. See, they haven't gotten the full picture like we have. For the, but notice it says, verse 6, For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. We think of the two years that Joseph stayed in prison, was forgotten. His own brothers and his family all were in that prison for two years of famine. Joseph has another perspective that they do not. 
They, Joseph has been privy to God's revelation. Verse 7, it says, And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He's made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. So do you see how God's revelation caused him to be able to come out of the pit and actually be with that azure blue, our God who is alive? <laughs> he, he saw it. But you know, it's obvious that his own brothers started playing in their mind. Obviously, this can't be the reason that our brother is not exacting his vengeance. He's waiting until our father dies. Look, and we say this because of chapter 50, they came up with another lie. Remember they lied to their father about him being torn in, in two with, with, by, by a wild beast? They contrived another lie and came to Joseph and said that, that, that our father wanted you to take care of us because of, you know, even though we had done all of those horrible things to you. And look at verse 19. Joseph said to them, this is Genesis 50, do not fear for am I in the place of God? So he saw that judgment, vengeance is mine, I'll repay, says Joseph. No, it was, says the Lord. He knew that was in God's hands. It's not in my place to exact vengeance. Only the, the dictators of this world think that that's okay. And we've seen examples of that this week. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God could take their evil and turn it about to bring about good. That reminds me of Romans 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. His purpose. We don't have to cower and bend to the purposes of, 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 the, of the dictators of this world. Whether that's on the playground or, or, or a presidency in Russia. He says, I'm not in the place of God. God meant this for good. Why? To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I'll provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. I love this. Only God could heal that kind of sibling rivalry. Only God could heal that kind of a bereavement, that kind of, 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 of a betrayal. Only God can heal that, and no one could have seen that coming except God. God saw it. And because of the revelation of God, Joseph was able to rise above the situation, and he was not embittered toward his brothers. He loved them. It changed his perspective and that's why it's, it's so important that the revelation of God didn't stop with dreams and riddles. It ended with Christ and his spirit. Well, it began for you and me. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, the passage that we began our, our lesson with, with long ago at various times and in various ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He's spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So Jesus is so powerful that he created the world. God created the world through Jesus. And if God is speaking through Jesus, how much greater of a situation do we have than him speaking through the prophets? Look at verse 3. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his His nature. So if you think about it, this is saying God is the bulb and Jesus is the light that comes from it. He's the radiance. He's the glory. And that light is shining bright. That light is not dimmed. And that light shone through that metro station when we saw that. That light shone as we sang when we all get to heaven and our God is alive. That light was brighter, wasn't it? It was brighter. Brighter than anything in here that's physical spiritual. <laughs> it's so powerful. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. If God can hold up the universe by the word of his power, then he can hold you up. He can hold up a nation. 
He can hold up Ukraine. We've been praying for Ukraine and for the brothers and sisters and them striving to stand for what is right. We've been praying for Mark Posey, who's been stuck behind those lines, and he's been able to, he's, he's, well, he's been able to get to Poland. Answer to my prayer. Answer to yours. In verse 3, keep going here. It says, He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What did Jesus decide to do? And Upholding the universe by the word of His power, that's a huge task to create the world by the word of His power. What did He decide to do? Offer purification for your sin and for my sin. That's greater than anything in this universe for your sin to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. In the same, in the same breath, we have the people on the day of Pentecost who were literally in the pit of despair because they'd killed the Messiah that the prophets told them about. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them, he literally offered them the rope that was their hope to get them out of that hole they dug for themselves. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for this promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Notice Joseph told his brothers, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of your little ones. His greatest exacting of vengeance could have been, you know, I could have had a whole lot of children if y'all hadn't have sent me at 17 years old, I'm going to take every one of your children from you. He, he could have done that as a result of, of, of getting back at his brothers. But no, he says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of your children. In the same way, we've, we, we realize the very murderers of our Savior were taken care of and their children and you and me who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call. God is calling you and me to the power that he gave in purification for sin. It's as simple as that. But it's up to us to grab hold of the rope. We could stay in the pit of sin that we dig for ourselves, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But if Joseph was given the opportunity to get out, wouldn't he have? Because he didn't know the, full, the rest of the story. God, in his infinite wisdom, brought him to save you and to save me because Judah, the very one that was going to kill or, or was, was going to sell him, who said to sell him into slavery, through his line came Jesus. And what if Joseph had killed his children? Then he'd have killed our opportunity to be saved. God's providence is so much bigger than our understanding. And there is no reason for us to ever be embittered by the, 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 the problems that we face. Give it to Jesus. He was willing to go to that pit of despair and take on your sin and my sin. Lay it at the foot of the cross. This morning we have an invitation we're offering. Is there anything that we can encourage you? Will you lay it down while we stand and while we sing?